Good morning, my friends, and welcome to our Sunday Sermon for High Point Church this morning. Let us pray. Father, we come before you with heavy and humble hearts. Our nation right now is going through a very difficult time, and we just pray for your glory and grace, Lord, and we pray that those of us who know Christ as Savior will be sensitive to the promptings of the Holy Spirit and filled with love for those around us. And just think deeply about what you would have to teach us during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, my friends, as I uh, sort of alluded to in my prayer, there are some rather serious things going on in our nation. It has been an eventful week. A lot of things are going on. A lot of people are frightened. There's a lot of grief because something horrible happened in our nation, and we are seeing some repercussions of that. As I was thinking about that, I honestly considered stopping our regular Genesis series and preaching a uh, sermon that had something to do with uh, the relevance of some of these events. And as I thought about that and as I prayed about it, I realized that nothing could be more relevant than the passage we are looking at today for the things we're dealing with as a nation. We're dealing with tensions brought about by... Uh, certain people groups not having gotten a fair shake, leading to a lot of hostility. Of course, there was a terrible murder that exacerbated some of these things, and a lot of people are very upset, and that's led to some other events that uh, have some other people concerned, and just uh, going back and forth with all of these things, there is just a lot to think about. With that, I want to remind you that our series in Genesis is called The Context of Everything. And as we've been going through Genesis, we've been seeing some themes that really explain the world around us about creation, about the fall into sin, and about a lot of other things. Let me just review a couple of points of things we've seen in the, the past few weeks, and we will tie all of this in to the relationship of today's passage. When we were in Genesis chapter 1, in one of the early sermons in the series, we saw that every human being is created in the image of God, which means that every human being, every single human being, has the right to respect and dignity, and to not show any human being respect and dignity is to not show proper respect to the image of God, and therefore to show disrespect to God himself. One of the things we learned as we looked at the story of Adam and Eve is that all human beings do come from uh, one couple, one man and one woman. And we're going to see that that uh, gets even a little more narrow with the reality of Noah's flood. Bill Nye, Bill Nye the science guy, who has often been a critic of different elements of conservative Christianity, and definitely does not like some of the things we have to say about the age of the earth and other things, um, he has this quote where he's, he's trying to encourage human beings to move beyond ideas of racism, racial superiority, and others. And Bill Knight's famous quote says, there really is no such thing as race. We all came from Africa, we are all of the same stardust, we are all going to live and die on the same planet, a pale blue dot in the vastness of space. We have to work together. Now, I have some respect for uh, Bill Nye's sentiment there, but let me make an observation. It's interesting that he does ascribe to the, the theory of Africa rather than the Fertile Crescent as uh, the origins of the human race, and there's some discussion about that among evolutionary biologists. But I want to observe that Bill Nye would think that the human race developed over a period of something like uh, 4.5 billion years. So he sees this as a very, very, very long process that ultimately led to human beings and others. Well, on the other hand, those of us who are Christians who take a very, very literal approach to the Bible, we believe that all human beings are descended from Adam, you know, less than 6,000 years ago, 
And ultimately, we're also all descended from Noah after the flood. And uh, Noah, you know, this we were talking like roughly 4,500 years ago. So all human beings from a biblical perspective, we're all the same family, we're all the same blood, and we came from the source not all that long ago. Even if one does ascribe to the theories of biological evolution, and, and if we're talking about macroevolution or species-to-species -species evolution, we don't believe in that here at High Point Church, but even if one did ascribe to that, 4,500 years would not be enough time for there to be any sort of superiority among different human beings. The point I'm making, friends, is any idea of racism or racial superiority from a conservative viewpoint on God's word, it doesn't make sense. And if you believe the Bible is the word of God without error, and you have any lingering feelings like that, you have to pray to God to obliterate them. There is no room for that in biblical Christianity. So that's just kind of an aside to, to tell you how something in our text relates very much to some things that we are dealing with as a nation as we uh, think through how to work through this with one another. Last week we talked about the fact that God keeps his promises. God is as good as his word, and he will always do exactly what he says. This makes it all the more meaningful when, on certain occasions, when God has already made a promise that he is already certain to keep, he strengthens and solidifies that promise by making what the Bible calls a covenant. Covenants permeate the word of God. God is a covenant-making and covenant-keeping God. And as we look at the, the introduction to Genesis chapter 9 and kind of God setting some parameters for things after the flood, we're going to take into consideration what it means that God is a covenant-keeping God and what, what we can take from that for ourselves. I actually call today's sermon, Living Under the Rainbow. Genesis chapter 9. Then God blessed Noah and his son, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall on the beasts of the earth and on the birds in the sky and on every creature that moves along the ground. And on all the fish in the sea, they are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves about will be food for you, just as I gave you the green plants, now I give you everything." but you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood in it. And for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal, and from each human being, too, I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God... He has made mankind. As for you, be fruitful and increase in number, multiply on the earth, and increase upon it. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Now I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, the wild animals, and all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on the earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I am making between you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all life on the earth. 
All right, friends, so after the flood, God gives some new guidelines for the renewal of the human race. This is a fresh start. It's like beginning over with Noah and his family, and he gives some guidelines. First thing he does is to renew the creation mandate to be fruitful and multiply. We talked about the, that mandate a good deal in Genesis chapter 1, and in the previous chapter, in chapter 8, God told Noah to leave the ark so that the animals could refill the earth. But here he gives the commission, the same commission given to Adam, again, specifically for human beings. Verse 2 introduces another major change after the flood. Noah says that he has put, or, or pardon me, God says to Noah that he has now put the fear and dread of human beings on the animals. It's saying that animals, generally speaking, will now fear human beings. Andrea and I live out in uh, Pine Valley, and when you encounter wild animals, it's, it's usually pretty hard to get close to them. Um, some of you who uh, are my Facebook friends, you saw that I took this great picture of a snake that was in the parking lot at the place where we live, and uh, even that snake was trying to get away from me while I took the picture. Um, we have all of these rabbits. They're so cute, you know. I would love to go, uh, I mean, they, and there's probably any number of reasons I shouldn't do this anyway, but I would love to go, you know, sit by the rabbit and, you know, just kind of pet the rabbit like Snow White, you know, and, uh, you know, maybe let out a few bars of whistle while you work. But the rabbits run away from me, not like Snow White. You know, the deer, the coyotes, they, they avoid me. Um, because the fear and dread of, of human beings has been put on the animals. Now, the reasons for this are probably twofold. One is to protect animals from being overhunted when God has now allowed human beings to, uh, to eat meat, has made meat a part of their diet. Possibly there's some, some issue with the post-flood world, the same proteins not being available in plants. We, we can't explain that entirely, but now, after the flood, God says human beings can eat meat, but human beings have this uh, natural tendency to take more than what we need, and if animals were not afraid of human beings, and human beings were slaughtering animals for food, there's probably a very good chance that um, a lot of species would have gone into extinction very quickly. So there's kind of some fairness, I think, going on here in the animals are uh, going to run away. It's going to be a little harder to catch the food. Therefore, human beings in their sinful nature cannot overhunt the animals. There's also a protection of human beings um, element of this. you got to remember this was not a world of, uh, you know, guns and deer rifles and things like that, elephant guns, etc. Um, generally speaking, there's a lot of wild beasts that were much more powerful than human beings. I mean, you can't take on an elephant or a Bengal tiger or a, an African safari lion and these sorts of things. And so um, the fear of human beings being on animals also makes for the protection of human life. Now, I know there are exceptions to that. Of course, we have domesticated pets who are not afraid of human beings because they've been taught not to be, or some animals that uh, have been around human beings so regularly the fear goes away. I also understand we have... Uh, Things like um, man-eating lions and killer hippos, etc. And so, it's not an absolute rule, but generally speaking, God has established this new way of doing things so that when human beings can eat meat, it's not quite so easy to just uh, hunt animals to extinction. Verse 3 and 4 tell us that animals were now allowed for food. Like we said, before the flood... Human beings were not allowed by God to eat meat, but after the flood, God changed this. It, it brings to question some things in our mind, because we do look at the Bible and we do see that at times certain rules change. I remember a famous commercial from the, from the 1990s. I don't remember whose commercial it was, but it did have one of those really catchy little commercial jingles, you know. The rules have changed. It was probably about a video game system or, uh, you know, something like that. But sometimes in the Bible, you know, commands change. And when we look at the Bible, we have to understand that there are some commands God gives that are eternal, which reflect his intrinsic moral character. For example, probably the one most obvious one, and it fits very neatly into our Genesis passage today, 
You shall not murder, right? You can't murder people. That doesn't change. You're not allowed to murder people under some circumstances. That is one of God's universal moral codes. Um, do not steal, you know. Don't take something that doesn't belong to you, etc. But there are other things that change, like from the pre-flood to post-flood world, we see that people are allowed to eat meat. We know that during the, the, the era of the Old Testament law, there were certain kinds of foods that were forbidden that under the new covenant conditions in the New Testament, God is now allowing. So there are things that change in different time periods. What we have to understand is that if there are changeable commands for a purpose that God has in a certain age that change in another age, on the one hand, those are not commands related to God's eternal moral character. At the same time, obedience to God's commands is an eternal moral issue, and therefore, whatever age you live in, you do need to consider yourself bound by the specific commands God has given. The theologians call that a dispensational change. Dispensation just means that, that throughout history there are different ways God administers his kingdom on earth. A dispensation is an archaic way of talking about an administration, and, and God always administers his rule on earth through delegated human beings, and in that context, Sometimes, in different, at different times in human history, there are different guidelines because of something specific God wants to teach people. You may feel like all the rules should be the same uh, back to front. God doesn't seem to feel like that, and, you know, he didn't really ask your opinion when he wrote the Bible, so we just need to understand what God has given us. Even with the change, though, in verse 4, this is something very significant. Even with this dispensational change, we see that eating blood, consumption of blood, is something that God has universally forbidden. So even when God allows people to eat meat, people are not allowed to eat blood. He says, don't eat meat with the lifeblood in it. This is because... Um, this is because blood is far too sacred and far too significant to consume in this way. It says again and again in the book of Leviticus that the life is in the blood. And again and again in the New Testament, it talks about how the blood of Christ was shed for our sins. Blood is something very significant, and consumption of blood is not something um, acceptable before God. So that's just an, an important point to note as we work through. Now, in verses 5 to 6, we see that God's prohibition against consuming blood leads to this discussion of murder and murder's consequences. Again, murder is one of those things that is against God's eternal moral character, and therefore it is always wrong. But God now institutes a consequence that will curb murder, which is essentially the death penalty. Hold that thought for a minute, and let me just make an observation. Prior to the flood, one of the things that led to the flood was violence throughout the earth. There was uncurbed violence. Um, God had, had put his eternal morality on the human heart through conscience. Everyone had a conscience. People had a basic understanding from their conscience of right and wrong. They suppressed their conscience, and without official consequences given by God, violence got out of hand, and it got so out of hand that God destroyed the entire earth with this flood. Now, after the flood, God is fully aware that people are not going to necessarily follow him just because they should or just because he's God. So God begins to institute this consequence to curb violence. If you murder another person, there's a guideline that your life will be taken, and that is an incredible motivator. There are a lot of people in this world who, unfortunately, would be very willing to kill another person because of their own uh, anger or grudge or even just sadistic fancies. I mean, we see these kinds of things in the world, but a major deterrent to that is that if you take other people's lives, your life, in theory, could be taken. 
And so the purpose of this life for life guideline that God establishes is to curb violence in the post-flood world because God is going to promise not to destroy the earth again with a flood and he is establishing guidelines to prevent human beings from getting to the point they were at when he did destroy them with the flood. Now, if we were to connect this with the modern day capital punishment discussion, let me make a couple of uh, just... Uh, basic observations about that. I do not believe that this life for life guideline means that you have to politically support capital punishment. That is a robust discussion. There are a lot of factors that play into that. They may, they may relate to the justice system of a given nation. Sometimes there are economic questions. I mean, I recently read an article that it's, it's uh, more expensive to put somebody to death than to keep them in prison for life. And I, I, I don't know, I haven't done all of that research myself. What I am saying is that I'm not, well, what I'm not saying is that Genesis tells us you must support politically capital punishment in your given society. However, it does mean you can't say that capital punishment is wrong before God. Some of my friends who oppose any idea of a life for a life or a capital punishment, they say, well, we shouldn't ever, you know, put people to death because they're made in the image of God. But when you look at the Genesis text, the very reason God institutes this life for life consequence is because people are created in the image of God. And because people are created in the image of God, God puts this in place to curb the issue of murder and violence in the world. Murder is the greatest crime because it destroys one who is made in the image of God. And quite often those who murder, I know there's exceptions, but quite often those who murder once, it gets easier to do it again and again and again. And so sometimes for the protection of human beings made in the image of God, it becomes necessary to remove a danger to other human beings. You may wholeheartedly agree with that premise, that premise may bother you very much. I don't know. The issue is whatever you think about it, Genesis 9 is the first place you've got to start wrestling because this is established by God. And in, in Romans chapter 13, the Apostle Paul reiterates the fact that God did uh, place the sword in the hands of the government. In his case, the Roman government, and just to put that in context for you, if you were a Roman citizen, capital punishment was uh, getting your head cut off by a sword. So when the Apostle Paul says in Romans 13 that uh, the government does not bear the sword in vain, that's what he's talking about, and you can look at that in context. So work through that, think through that, but, you know, the Bible does give this guideline, and sometimes that is necessary according to God's word. Verse 7 just gives a repetition of verse 1. This idea of uh, being fruitful and multiplying and filling the earth is very important. God had given it to Adam, and, and we see he gives it to Noah several times here. Then moving on, verses 8 to 11, God solidifies his promise of 8, 21, and 22, and he solidifies it with a covenant. I remind you, my friends, God is as good as his word. He doesn't have to make deals. He doesn't have to make covenants. He doesn't have to make pledges because he's going to do what he says. But when he steps out and makes a covenant, it's a way of him saying, what I'm promising right now is very important, so important, I am going to make essentially a bond in blood, a covenant. In the ancient world, covenants were almost always sealed in blood. A covenant was a pledge or a treaty, and there's so many things we could say about ancient covenants, but one of the most important things is they were almost always sealed in blood. In this case, God makes a covenant in response to the sacrifices Noah had made at the end of uh, chapter 8. So that's the blood we have here. The word covenant actually comes from the word cut. A covenant is, uh, if we were going to say, I mean, literally is always a little bit of a, of a dicey thing to say in linguistics. You know, there's a funny statement about, I, I literally, hate, I, it literally kills me when people misuse the word literally. But the point is, the word covenant does come from this idea of to cut. A covenant is a cutting. But if we were to flush that out a little bit, a covenant is a, uh, a treaty that is sealed in blood. 
A theologian by the name of O. Palmer Robertson, Robertson defines a biblical covenant as a bond in blood sovereignly administered. Uh, that's from his book, The Christ of the Covenants. There's a lot in that book I don't necessarily agree with, but that is a good definition of a biblical covenant, a bond in blood sovereignly administered. The reason that covenants are sealed in blood is because all covenants point us to the blood of Christ. Friends, it is only because of the blood of Christ which would be shed at Calvary that human beings can't interact with God at all. That is why right after human sin, in Genesis 3.15, God promised the coming Deliverer. It didn't talk explicitly about the blood of the Deliverer then, but this was always implicit in the sacrifices. We see these sacrifices throughout, and we see covenants sealed in this blood, because the blood of any animal put in sacrifice points us to Christ as the ultimate Deliverer. Some call this covenant that God makes with Noah the Noahic Covenant. Noahic, because it's a covenant that God made with Noah, but understand that the covenant with Noah is really a covenant with the entire human race, and it's a covenant that God will never again destroy the earth with a flood. He will never again bring a flood judgment. Now, when we have a covenant sealed in blood that will deliver human beings from, from judgment, friends, understand that is pointing us to the reality that ultimately the blood of Christ will deliver us from God's eternal judgment. You can't look at a covenant, you can't look at the shedding of blood in the Old Testament and not see Jesus. You can't. That's not what God intended. All of these things point us to the blood of Christ, which ultimately will deliver us from sin. But the Noahic Covenant, as we said, promises that God will never again destroy the world with a flood. And in doing so, as we said, it also lays down some basic foundations for human government with this life for a life ordinance. In verses 12 to 16, God explains that he is giving a sign of the covenant. So when God establishes this covenant that he'll never again destroy the earth with a flood, he gives us this reminder and the reminder is the rainbow. I think everybody out there, besides uh, anybody who may be listening to this sermon who, who might not actually be able to see, and, you know, we, we apologize for that, but we are glad if the Lord gave you spiritual sight. But if you can see, then you've probably seen a rainbow. You've probably been through rain, and you've seen a rainbow afterward. I saw this great, uh, this great video that a guy took where there's actually a rainbow inside of a rainbow. I think it was up by Lake Tahoe, and it was, uh, you know, I think you probably find that on YouTube. But most of us have seen a rainbow, and friends, there are very few things in this world as beautiful as a rainbow. And every time we see a rainbow, we should be reminded of God's promise that God will never again destroy the earth with a flood. Some scholars believe that the symbolism here is that the, the rainbow represents God hanging up his battle bow after judgment. Battle bow as in like a bow and arrow, right? And the, the, the rainbow, obviously, it's in a bow shape, and that's the same basic uh, shape as a bow and arrow. So if you were to hang your battle bow on the wall, assuming you didn't unstring it, it would be in that shape. And so that is uh, something that many, many scholars think is at play here with what's going on. Whatever the case, my friends, the rainbow is a sign of God's mercy. God withholding judgment in a covenant sealed in blood. And when you, after a rain, when you see a rainbow, remember what it means. Now, of course, you should think, thank God he's not going to destroy the earth again with a flood. But that should point us to deeper thoughts. There's this great uh, Peanuts cartoon where... You have, uh, you have Linus and Sally sitting by the window, and there's a big rain, and Sally's like, look at all that rain. What if there was a great flood that, that drowned us all? And Linus is like, oh, well, actually, in the book of Genesis, God gave the rainbow to, to, prove, to promise people that God would never destroy the earth again with a flood. And Sally's like, oh, I feel so much better. And Linus is like, yeah, sound theology does that. That's actually one of my favorite little cartoons because there's such a good point and because I, I you know, like to sort of kind of think of myself as a theologian. However that may be, 
the rainbow, besides just reminding us of the bare fact that God will never again destroy the earth with a flood, it should be a constant reminder of God's mercy. I titled today's sermon, Living Under the Rainbow, because when we think about a rainbow, we need to think about what that means, and we need to be thinking about God's mercy. Sometimes in our world, the rainbow is used to be representing ungodly things. The rainbow's been, been hijacked. For a while last year, I had a job uh, work, uh, as a parking cars in downtown San Diego as a valet, and I would drive uh, on my way back from my valet job when I would get off, because I worked the overnights, and I would get off about 7 a.m., and I would drive through a certain neighborhood, and uh, during a certain time of year, this neighborhood would be plastered with rainbows everywhere because of what it represented to these people, a certain, uh, a certain sinful lifestyle that is being celebrated at times in our culture around us. But friends, we need, we need to not let bad uses of the rainbow take the rainbow away from us. I mean, really, my friends, we Christians should be the ones wearing the rainbow t-shirt to, uh, wait, maybe with a picture of, of the ark or something, just to be clear about what we're talking about, but so we can remind people that we are the real rainbow people and that God's rainbow is a sign of God's mercy. I remember uh, back in uh, 2015, there was a, a major, a major legal landmark that happened in the United States that led to a lot of people putting like a rainbow-colored uh, Facebook photo on Facebook to show their support of this. Uh, one of the things I, I posted on my Facebook status was, "I'm so thankful that God will never again destroy the earth with a flood." How nice to get so many reminders of that fact on Facebook. I think that's the Facebook post I've made in my lifetime that actually got the most likes. But friends, there is actually a kind of an irony here, because sometimes when people who are living in a way that is opposed to, to God's clear commandments, they're, they're using the rainbow as their symbol, it is interesting that the rainbow does remind us that God's judgment is postponed, and he's not going to again destroy the world with a flood, and in some ways, even those who are living in a lifestyle of sin, God's rainbow is a reminder of God's mercy to them, that, that right now judgment is being withheld. It says uh, that God would, when God sees the rainbow, he would see and remember, and he would not again destroy the earth with a flood. Now, you, you read that as modern-day Americans, and you might think, well, that God would see and remember. That sounds like, what, is God going to forget it otherwise? I mean, I thought God was supposed to be omniscient, but he forgets that he's not going to destroy the earth, and he needs to see the rainbow. But again, we need to go back to what we said last week about the biblical meaning of the word remember. Remember doesn't just mean, oh, you forgot something, but now you remember it again. Remember has to do with action. It has to do with doing what you said. So when God remembers people, when God remembers things, I mean, in the Psalms, sometimes it'll say, you know, Lord, remember David. It doesn't mean, oh, I think God forgot who David was. It means that God had made that covenant with David, and Lord, fulfill the terms of your covenant, please. And, uh, same thing here. God sees the rainbow, and he will not destroy the earth with a flood, even when he sees human sin. Friends, when you see a rainbow after a rain, remember God's mercy. When God describes his character, like in the book of Jonah, we went through that in the Wednesday night Bible study, when God describes his character, he always points to his mercy as one of his defining characteristics. And when you think about God's mercy, it should lead us to be merciful people. People who live under the rainbow. People who are more characterized by mercy than anger and judgment. What a beautiful gift to remember God's mercy. What a beautiful thing a rainbow is. And as we, as we close out some thoughts here today, just remember, friends, one of the things I'm wanting to tell you is Christians are the real rainbow children. And when we see the beautiful gift God has given us in the sky after a rain, let us remember God's mercy and let it inspire us to show mercy to others. 
Those of us who love God, we love his commandments, we love his righteousness, and we see other people not following, sometimes this can, this can cause us to have these feelings of hostility and anger and wanting God's judgment to come on the ungodly. But that is not a rainbow perspective. A rainbow perspective, a perspective guided by the scriptures through the covenant God made with Noah, with all of humanity. If we want to be like God, we should be people who pray for God's mercy on the ungodly. Pray that they will see the light of Christ. Pray that they will come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and thus be saved from the eternal consequences of their sin. If you see sinners and you're, you're more filled with anger than you are mercy and compassion, you need to take a closer look at the rainbow and you need to think a little more deeply about who God is. We understand that God is a righteous judge and his judgment will come on the ungodly at the end of the age. But friends, God desires repentance. He desires to show mercy. And he's made us vessels of his mercy, and we need to remember that. <laughs> we need to live like we understand what the rainbow sign God has given us is really about. God's mercy and the ability to avoid God's judgment through a blood sacrifice. And again, every blood sacrifice points us to Jesus Christ and the ability he's given human beings to escape God's eternal judgment through his death on the cross. Friends, just coming back to where I started out at the end of this sermon, thinking about God's mercy, thinking about the fact that we are all human beings from one bloodline, descended from a person who lived roughly 4,500 years ago. I just also want to give you this final, this final thought, this final, I guess, exhortation to love one another. A lot of things are swirling around out there, and part of loving other people is trying to understand things from their perspective. Understand what they're going through, empathize with their pain and suffering. Christ came to earth, he became incarnate to empathize with our pain and suffering. We need to be willing to empathize with the pain and suffering of others to seek to understand so we can better understand how we can all love one another. And so much of that, my friends, begins with listening to other people. Now, what I find so ironically is when I talk to people about listening to other people, they always want to jump to that person should be listening to me. Or if I try to tell somebody, you know, in a counseling situation or something, well, you're not really listening. So often people's default is, well, no, I need people to listen to me. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, part of your ethic is, Philipp is Philippians 2, where in humility you consider other people better than yourselves. And let me just suggest to you that you can't make other people listen to you. Not in most circumstances, you can't make other people listen to you, but you actually have some control about whether you listen to other people and try to understand what they're trying to communicate. Somehow we need to put our petty divisions aside in the body of Christ, understand that we're all one bloodline, and those of us who have been redeemed by Jesus Christ are unified in a common salvation. Whatever we look like, we are all brothers and sisters in Christ, and we need to love one another and love the lost and not be constantly trying to defend ourselves. Just really hope you'll, you'll be thinking about that and praying about that as, as we as a nation try to work through these difficult times. Well, let's pray. Father, we love you. We ask for your grace and mercy. We pray that as a uh, as the old song says, you will teach us how to love each other and fill us with your joy divine. Bless us as we go out, Lord, and we do pray for, for peace, for grace, for mercy, for an attitude of uh, compassion and listening and caring in our nation during this troubled time. We give you these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen couple of quick announcements. Wednesday night Bible study will be streaming on Wednesday night at 6.30. We are continuing our study of the book of Jude. 
Um, we will be having an in-service meeting at High Point this coming Sunday. We are going to be following a very, very, very careful set of guidelines. If you like our searches page on Facebook, you can see those, but they're, they're the same general guidelines um, most people are following. They're, they're based on the guidelines the governor has given for the opening of houses of worship. Um, we will be continuing to stream our sermons and Bible studies even when they are live because we do want to we do want that to be available for those who are not yet comfortable coming out. Also, in our Sunday service, it's going to be families together. We're not going to have uh, breakout Sunday school classes and things like that. Not just yet, but uh, those days are coming. Love you all so much. Thanks for taking the time to listen to the sermon.